my fellow North Carolinians. Hillary Clinton is a woman who has spent her entire life fighting for children and families. She knows that all Americans and all North Carolinians are at our best when we work together and fight for each other and lift each other up. When, when we put families first, bring diverse groups of people together for a common purpose. She knows that and lives it. Right now, right now, the most urgent need for North Carolina and our nation is to build an economy that works for everyone. Not just those at the top. And Hillary Clinton, who I'm going to fight for with all I've got to be the next President of the United States, is here in our state today to put forward her vision on how to do exactly that. In coming to North Carolina, to lay out her economic vision for people from all walks of life, she couldn't have chosen a better state. In North Carolina, we have a proud history of coming together across party lines and working in good faith to invest in our communities and our people with smart education and economic growth policies. That's what she's for. Those kinds of policies that all of you have worked for all of your life have put North Carolina at the forefront of the new economy. Look at where we are today the great research triangle of North Carolina, the envy of the world. And I believe that people are ready to choose that path again. Because, folks, while our economy is strengthening, a lot of people are not seeing the benefits of that strength in their paychecks. And they know that in the next president, they need a champion. A champion. A champion who will have their backs. Bring people together and make sure that everyone shares in the rewards of our economy. By the way, do you remember the greatest economic growth period we had in modern history? When my friend Bill Clinton was president. Another Clinton presidency when America created 20 million new jobs. We did that here in America. And I'm honored and delighted to we welcome you to today's important event. Feature who will have people's backs, bring people together, and make sure that everyone shares in that economy. Hillary Clinton, with whom I have worked in Arkansas and across America, knows the truth that convinced me, by the way, folks, to come back for a third term as governor one time. 
she knows that economic growth and jobs depend on a good education and great public schools. And I am proud to support her goal of ensuring that every child in America in every zip code across our country has access to a world-class education. And she will lead us to that. That is the best investment we can make in our future. That's how we build an economy that works for everyone. And Hillary Clinton has the know-how and the determination and the strength to get that done. I go way back with the Clintons. I saw her as the first lady in Arkansas where she was the workingest woman in a state for education that I ever saw in my life. And the best friend for children and the best friend for teachers. And she has, she has the qualifications to be a great president for children and parents. Decades of work in the White House, in the Senate, where, by the way, she worked across the aisles and got everybody working together. Wouldn't that be great in America again? And as Secretary of State, where she learned about children all over the world, and we care about all of them, don't we? She will be the president that working families need in the White House. And folks, it is a privilege that in my lifetime and in yours, we'll follow the first African-American president in history. with the first woman president in history. Here in North Carolina, we put our stock in doers, not big talkers. Hillary Clinton is a doer. She doesn't play a doer on TV like some people I'll not mention. She is a doer. And she fits at North Carolina, our North Carolina motto, where we say the weak grow strong and the strong grow great. We can do that for America under her. Hillary Clinton, Hillary Clinton has put families first and been a champion for those who need help throughout her entire career. As First Lady of the United States, she worked with members of both parties in Congress, spearheading the passage of the state children's health insurance program. Now, this was a program that provided health insurance for the first time to 8 million American children. And 80,000 of them were in North Carolina. That is about 1,000 per county. Pretty amazing. She led it, and we worked with her. Folks, I am so proud of her, and I believe in her so much. And I am now here to present to you to introduce her a teacher. Yeah. 
Her name is Alicia Wilkerson, a woman who can speak to Hillary's support firsthand. I want you to listen to her. She's a proud mother of five children, and S-CHIP, the Children's Health Insurance Program, has been a godsend for her family. She's made the most of her opportunities. She's a wonderful teacher. She's also going back to school to become a public health educator. She knows the struggles that working families in North Carolina and across America are going through. She's here to talk about why she has faith in Hillary Clinton to be the president that brings people together, that puts families first, and that builds an economy that works for everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, Alicia Wilkerson. that you just gave and thank you so much for all of the help that you've done for especially the children and especially for educators thank you again governor Hunt. i know you're all ready to see secretary soon to be president clinton so that moment is near it's coming very soon so as governor hunt said my name is alicia wilkerson and i grew up in a small town called goldsboro north carolina yes I was educated in the Wayne County public school system. And if someone would have told me that I would be on this stage following behind Governor Hunt and introducing the first woman to be nominated by a major party to become the President of the United States, I would have never believed you. So this is truly a moment in history. of my life. I won't be before you long. And I just want to let you know why I support Hillary Clinton. My life, I have seen so many various trials. And I have seen how Hillary Clinton's leadership and her ideals and programs have helped catapult people like me, your everyday person in society. Like I said, I grew up in Goldsboro, North Carolina. I ended up going to Lenore Community College and I took a phlebotomy course. Because outside of my five children that I have, my next passion is health care. Um, and I started working as a phlebotomist and I moved up to Durham. Actually, I packed the kids in the car. I left Goldsboro because I just couldn't find employment there. So I wanted to further my education and I was able to land a job at Duke University Medical Center as a phlebotomist. <laughs> I had an 11 year career working with, in medical oncology with two top medical oncologists and during this time I can say that I did face various trials. Thankfully for, uh, for Se Secretary Clinton, she has funded or supported as First Lady programs such as S-CHIP. Now without S-CHIP, I don't know what I would have done. Here in North Carolina, we know this program um, is called as North Carolina's Health Choice. So to explain to you how important this was to me, mind you, I was a phlebotomist making $10.37 an hour, fresh in the door at Duke, and I had five children. Two of my children ended up needing surgeries. I don't know if any of you ever been to a hospital, but you have parking and so many things that you have to pay for. If it were not for Hillary Clinton and her push for affordable health care, I don't know what I would have done. It would have been devastating to me and my family to try to get my children through such a trying time in their life. One daughter had to be hospitalized much longer than I thought. But thankful to Hillary Clinton, because this is a first-hand testament for me, and her support of affordable health care, I have been able to take care of my children, and they were able to get the surgeries that they needed. Also... <laughs> Thank you.
Also through S-CHIP, my children did need medication after their surgeries and the most I had for a copay was like $3. So that is awesome. So now moving forward, as I spoke to you, I wanted to further my education. So I did graduate with a degree while I was employed at Duke from Durham Tech Community College. I did end up with my associate's degree, and we all know that Hillary is a big supporter in a push for education funds. This is so important and a huge investment in our future. I did end up leaving Duke after my 11 years, and now I am enrolled at North Carolina Central University to, to pursue a degree in public health education. I really support Hillary Clinton because she has made a difference in my life. I believe Hillary Clinton is the person that we need in the White House and she can encompass everyone, everyone that's in this class, everyone in this crowd, and not only people that vote for her, but everyone. So I tip my hat off to Hillary Clinton for looking at a little person like me. much longer for what we all have been waiting for, the moment to see Secretary Hillary Clinton and we hope and pray soon to be our future President of the United States of America, the first woman President of the United States of America. And I just want to thank you all for your time to listening to my story, as I know my story could be representative of each and every one of you out here, that each and every one of you have a story, and we know and we trust that Hillary Clinton cares about our stories. And I am waiting for Hillary Clinton to come on stage with me. confess I was having such a good time backstage <laughs> listening to the 120 minutes band, listening to Mary Wingate do the national anthem, and just being absolutely transported by Shay Taylor and friends, the gospel group that got us all just going today. A better twosome than the people you just saw up here because I honestly believe Jim Hunt was not only one of the best governors North Carolina ever had, but one of the best governors anywhere in America in the last years. And what he did to really put North Carolina on a path to the future uh, has stood the test of time. We've had a few glitches with others who don't seem to understand what the ingredients are for building an economy that works for everybody, not just those at the top, but Jim Hunt knows that. And I look forward to continuing to work with him, and I was so delighted that you had a chance, as I did, to hear 
Alicia Wilkerson talk about her journey, how hard she has worked raising her children, getting an education, making it possible for her to have a better future. And I so greatly appreciate her mentioning the S-CHIP program, which has helped 8 million kids every year get health insurance. Now, because we're in North Carolina and we have a lot of friends here, I want to acknowledge some of them. Your Secretary of State, Elaine Marshall. Dan Blue, the Minority Leader of the North Carolina Senate, Representative Larry Hall, the Democratic Leader of the North Carolina House of Representatives, Linda Coleman, running for Lieutenant Governor, Judge Mike Morgan, running against a Republican Supreme Court incumbent. And don't forget that Dan Blue III is running for state treasurer. Josh Stein running for attorney general. And let's give a big round of applause to your next governor, Attorney General Roy Cooper. Your next Ag Commissioner, Walter Smith. United States Senator Deborah Ross. We're going to work hard in this election to elect as many Democrats up and down the ticket so that North Carolina can get back on the path to the future, get off this detour that you've been on. I have to start by saying, if you notice anything different about me today, it could be that now I've got double the grandmother glow. <laughs> this, this past weekend, Chelsea and Mark had a little boy, and we are all totally over the moon about it. Um, Obviously, our family will do everything we can to make sure that little Charlotte and now little Aiden grow up with every possible opportunity. I know that's what every parent and grandparent, aunt or uncle, godmother, godfather, people who care about the children in our lives, that's exactly how we all feel. And I believe with all my heart that you should not have to be the grandchild of a former president or secretary of state to have every opportunity available to you in this country. Every single child deserves the chance to live up to his or her God-given potential. And that has been the cause of my life it's rooted in the values that I learned from my family and my faith. We are all in this together, and we have a responsibility to lift each other up. As we Methodists like to say, do all the good you can to all the people you can in all the ways you can. And that is absolutely true for our children. That's why I got into public service in the first place. And it's why I am determined that we will win this election in November. And I, I, think, I think it's an understatement to say that Americans face a choice in November. As I said yesterday in Ohio, Donald Trump offers no real solutions for the economic challenges we face. He just continues to spout reckless ideas that will run up our debt and cause another economic crash. 
I'm here today to offer an alternative. I have a clear vision for the economy, and it's this. We need to make sure our economy works for everyone, not just those at the top. Not just for the rich or the well-connected, not just for people living in some parts of the country or people from certain backgrounds and not others. I mean everyone. And I have a plan. I have a plan to get us there. Five steps we can take together to drive growth that's strong, fair, and lasting. Growth that reduces inequality, increases upward mobility, that reaches into every corner of our country. The measure of our success will be how much incomes rise for hardworking families, how many children are lives that support a middle class life. And not only that, jobs that provide a sense of dignity and pride. That's what it means to have an economy that works for everyone, not just those at the top. That's the mission. And I'm asking all of you to join me in it. Now, we have to overcome some big challenges. I will admit that. First, too many of our representatives in Washington are in the grips of a failed economic theory called trickle-down economics. <laughs> I do not doubt their sincerity, but it has been proven wrong again and again. But, but they are still are wrong again and again. But there still are there still are people in Congress who insist on cutting taxes for the wealthy instead of investing in our future. They careen from one self-inflicted crisis to another, shutting down the government, threatening to default on our national debt, refusing to make the common sense investments that used to have broad bipartisan support, like rebuilding our roads and our bridges, our tunnels, our highways, our airports. or investing in better education from zero through high school and college. Now, look, I, I, I like to look at evidence. I plead to that. I think evidence is important when you're making decisions that affect other people's lives. And if the, if the evidence were there to support this ideology, I would have to acknowledge that, but we have seen the results. Twice now in the past 30 years, a Republican president has caused an economic mess and a Democratic president has had to come in and clean it up. And yes, we know too many special interests with too many lobbyists have stood in the way of progress while protecting the perks of the privileged few. And it's not just Washington. Too many corporations have embraced policies that favor hedge funds and other big shareholders and top management at the expense of their workers, communities, and even their long-term value. They're driven by Wall Street's obsession with short-term share prices and quarterly earnings. Now, a recent survey of corporate executives found that more than half, when asked, would hold off making a successful long-term investment, maybe in their workers or plant and equipment or research, if it meant missing a target in the next earnings report. So corporations stash cash overseas or they send it to top shareholders in the form of stock buybacks or dividends instead of raising wages or investing in research and development. And then this pressure, this short-term pressure, 
leads to perverse incentives and outrageous behavior. It is wrong to take taxpayer dollars with one hand and give out pink slips with the other hand. And no company should be moving their headquarters overseas just to avoid paying their taxes here at home. And in addition, there have been big changes in how American families live, learn, and work. But our policies haven't kept up. And there are so many examples of this. Over the past several decades, women have entered the workforce and boosted our economy, yet we are the only, the only developed country that doesn't provide paid family leave of any kind. to rely on an old system of supports in a new economic reality. And no wonder, so many are struggling. The bottom line is that too many leaders in business and government have lost sight of our shared responsibility to each other and to our nation. And they let Wall Street take big risks with unregulated financial activities. They skew our tax code toward the wealthy. They fail to enforce our trade rules. They undermine workers' rights. They have forgotten that we are all in this together and we are at our best when we recognize that. Excessive inequality, such as we have today, reduces economic growth. Markets work best when all the stakeholders share in the benefits. So the challenges we face are significant. It's not easy to change Washington or how corporations behave. It takes more than stern words or a flashy slogan. It takes a plan. And it takes experience and the ability to work with both parties to get results. president who knows what we're up against, has no illusions about what we need to do to move ahead, but can actually get it done. And that is what I am offering because there is good news. The good news is everywhere I go, smart, determined men and women are working hard to reverse these trends. Mayors are pioneering innovative ways to work with the private sector to invest in their cities. Entrepreneurs and small businesses are building and hiring in places that bigger companies have abandoned. Unions are providing training programs that add value to the companies that employ their members. Union pension funds. Union pension funds are already investing in infrastructure projects that have supported more than 100,000 jobs here in our country. So do not grow weary. Do not grow weary. There are great ideas out there. And we are going to be partners in a big, bold effort to increase economic growth and distribute it more fairly to build that economy that works for everyone, not just those at the top. I believe the federal government should adopt five ambitious goals. First, let's break through the dysfunction in Washington. <laughs> to make the biggest investment in new good paying jobs since World War II. Second, Let's make college debt free for all. And transform the way we prepare Americans for the jobs of the future. Third, let's rewrite the rules 
So more companies share profits with their employees and fewer ship profits and jobs overseas. Finally, let's make sure that Wall Street corporations and the super rich pay their fair share of taxes. And all of this, all of this depends upon putting our families first and matching our policies to how we actually live and work in the 21st century. Now, briefly about these five points, let's start with jobs. Every American willing to work hard should be able to find a job that pays enough to support a family. And I know we can do this because I've seen it in the past. You know, I remember when I was growing up and America had come out of the upheaval of depression and world war, our leaders worked together to invest in a new foundation of American power and prosperity, highways to connect up our entire nation, college and housing for returning veterans and their families, unprecedented scientific research, and it worked. We built the greatest middle class the world has ever known. And now, now we got to get ambitious again. There is nothing we can't do. Let's be just as ambitious to build our 21st century American economy to produce the same results for hardworking Americans. In my first 100 days as president, I will work with both parties to pass a comprehensive plan to create the next generation of good paying jobs. Now, the heart of my plan will be the biggest investment in American infrastructure in decades, including, including establishing an infrastructure bank that will bring private sector dollars off the sidelines and put them to work here. And I've talked, I've talked with local leaders around America and I've seen the dire need for investment. In Tampa, for example, I saw how a smart, targeted highway investment near a major port can create thousands of good paying jobs, support the local economy and unlock national commerce. We can create millions of good paying jobs while preparing America to compete and win in the global economy. So let's set these big national goals. And you know, I know how important it is to rebuild our roads, our bridges and our airports, but we've got more work to do. Let's build better and let's connect every household to broadband by the year 2020. Let's build a cleaner, more resilient power grid with enough renewable energy to power every home in the country. Let's fix failing water systems like the one that poisoned children in Flint, Michigan. Let's renovate our public schools so every child in every community has access to safe, high-tech classrooms, laboratories, and libraries. Our 100 Days Jobs Package will also include transformational investments in key drivers of growth. Advanced manufacturing so we can make it in America and compete and win in the global economy. Making, making America the clean energy superpower of the 21st century which will create millions of jobs and help protect our planet. Recommitting to scientific research which can create new whole industries just like we did in the 90s when we started mapping the human genome. And small businesses which should be the engine for creating new jobs across America, they need to be free of red tape. They need to have access to credit. 
We need to slash unnecessary regulations, making it easier to get startup capital from community banks and credit unions. If you've got an idea for a small business, we want you to get started. Let's free entrepreneurs to do what they do best, innovate, grow, and hire, and make sure that the new service and caregiving jobs being created today are jobs that pay well, too. And that does mean raising the national minimum wage. So many of these jobs are so personal to us that they need to be respected and lifted up. And I, I know, I know, too, that we've got work to do to stand with those who are fighting for raising the minimum wage. It's not always how we think about this, but I can tell you another engine for growth and job creation would be comprehensive immigration reform. It will bring bring millions of workers into the formal economy so that you don't have an unlevel playing field, so that workers who are competing for those jobs get undercut because employers go out and find undocumented workers to do those jobs for a lower wage. And so I really believe it's not just the right thing to do. But it will be great. It will be smart for our economy. I want people to be able to compete. And I don't want, I don't want to have that disadvantage that exists in too many places where people are being priced out of the jobs they've always done. So we can work toward a full employment and full potential economy. And that does mean we can't ignore those who are still stuck on the sidelines or working part-time when what they really want is a full-time job. <laughs> or those trapped in long-term joblessness, whether they're veterans, workers with disabilities, people coming home from prison, or young people who tried to start their careers in the midst of the Great Recession. particularly want young people to feel that they're going to get good jobs that will give them that ladder of opportunity that they deserve to have in America. That's why I want to expand incentives like the New Markets Tax Credit, Empowerment Zones, and other ideas that bring business, government, and communities together to create good jobs in poor or remote areas. Places that have lost a factory or a mine where generations of families used to work. Anyone willing to work should get the help they need to qualify for and find that good job. And that means breaking down the barriers of systemic racism and discrimination that hold back. Those barriers they hold back African Americans, Latinos, Asian, and Native Americans, and women from fully participating in our economy. We need to reverse the long-term neglect that has dried up jobs and opportunity in communities of color, in poor communities. You know, it's not by accident that the unemployment rate now among black Americans is twice as high as among whites. Back in the 90s, we were closing that gap. Incomes were going up for everybody. So I think we're going to have to invest money to create jobs for young people because right now I'm worried that if young people don't get that first job when they're young, learn about work, understand the obligations as well as the promise of work, it will be even more difficult to get them into the workforce later on. way past time for us to guarantee equal pay for women, which is still not the reality. So you see, It is, 
it is not enough to have an affirmative agenda. We've got to knock down these barriers. And as, as you have seen here in North Carolina, discriminating against LGBT Americans is bad for business. So make no mistake, we will defend American jobs and American workers. We'll say no to bad trade deals and unfair trade practices, including the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which does not meet my high bar for creating good-paying jobs. No to assaults on the right to organize and bargain collectively. No to every attack on the dignity of working families. We're going to make this economy work for everybody. And it's time we started building it from the ground up, from every home and every community, all the way to Washington. very well that if you don't have the skills for the jobs of tomorrow, it's going to be difficult. Education is still the pathway for greater opportunities. Let's start at the beginning with making quality, affordable child care and preschool available in every community in the next 10 years so that we get our littlest Americans off to the best start. You know, Jim Hunt was a pioneer in this. Why did he care so much about children zero to five besides the fact that he cared about them? Because he knew there was a direct line to how the youngest children were treated, educated, and prepared for school, and what kind of jobs and economic competitiveness North Carolina would have. So we're going to start by helping families be their child's first teachers, and we're going to give them the support they need to do that. To primary and secondary education, I pledge to you we're going to make sure all kids have good teachers in good schools, no matter what zip code they live in. You know, for many years, thanks to people and leaders like Jim Hunt, North Carolina was a leading state when it came to education. Now, unfortunately, Thanks to your governor and the legislature, the average teacher's salary can barely support a family. It should not be a surprise that thousands have quit in recent years. We should support our teachers, not scapegoat them. make sure every student has options after high school, whether it's a four-year degree, free community college, an apprenticeship, or other forms of higher education. <laughs> we need to provide the skills and credentials that match the job openings of today and tomorrow. That's why I'm proposing new tax credits to encourage more companies to offer paid apprenticeships that let you earn while you learn. And I will support the union apprenticeships and training programs already out there. Not every good job in the economy of today and tomorrow requires a four-year college degree. We need to dignify skills training. So many young people have the talent and the will to succeed. They just need a helping hand. And that's why I want us to come together to help our young people break free from the burden of student debt. Now, <laughs> I'm sure we all have stories. I've met so many who tell me they can't start a business. They can't even move out of their parents' basement because of all the student debt holding them back. So let's set the goal to make debt-free college available for everyone so future students won't have to borrow a dime to pay for tuition at a public college or university. And let's liberate the millions of Americans who already have student debt by making it easier to refinance just like a mortgage. Let's make it easier to have debt forgiven by doing national service. Let's make it easier to repay what you owe. 
as a portion of your income so you never have to pay more than you can afford. I've set out a way to do this and we'll be talking more about it as we go forward in this campaign. Now my third goal is to rewrite the rules so more companies share profits with employees and fewer ship profits and jobs overseas. Now, I know there are a lot of businesses thriving here in North Carolina and across our country who see employees as assets to invest in, not costs to cut. They're building companies, not stripping them. They're creating good jobs, not eliminating them. But too many, too many businesses take the opposite view. Now, I am not asking corporations to be more charitable, although I think that is important. I'm asking corporations to realize that when more Americans prosper, they prosper too, right? When your paycheck grows, America grows. We are a 70% consumption economy. If we want higher growth, we've got to raise incomes so people have more disposable dollars to be able to spend instead of holding back out of fear of what will happen. So let's bring a long-term view back to boardrooms and executive suites. Let's restore the link between productivity growth and wage growth. As president, I will make it a national priority for more companies to share profits with employees on top of, not instead of, good wages. Let's recognize the people doing the work, putting in the hours. They're the ones who should be sharing the rewards. And we should continue to crack down on wage theft and make overtime count so companies that pay well can't be undercut by competitors paying poverty wages. And I believe we should strengthen unions which have formed the bedrock of a strong middle class. It should be easier to bargain collectively. That's not only fair, it makes workers more productive, it strengthens our economy. And let's close the loopholes that help companies ship jobs and profit overseas. Let's make companies that outsource jobs to other countries pay back the tax breaks they received while they were here in America. And if corporations try to move their headquarters to a foreign country to skip out on their tax bills, let's slap a new exit tax on them and then put that money to work in the communities left behind. And we should extend the rules that were passed in Dodd-Frank on Wall Street after the crisis and strengthen them both for the big banks and the shadow banking system. And I will veto any reforms to repeal those rules and vigorously enforce the law with accountability so Wall Street can never wreck Main Street again. Now, Fourth, let's make sure Wall Street corporations and the super rich pay their fair share of taxes. When people say the game is rigged, the best evidence is the tax code. It's riddled with scams, loopholes, and special breaks, like the carried interest loophole that lets some hedge fund managers pay a lower tax rate than a teacher or a nurse. That's not only unfair, it's bad economics, and we're going to stop it. I have been saying that for years. As president, if Congress won't ask, act, I will ask the Treasury Department to use its authority to close that loophole. And here's another idea that I will be pushing. Let's pass the so-called Buffett rule so top executives can't pay a lower rate than their secretaries. the wealthiest Americans to pay more, including a new tax on multimillionaires. That's not only the right thing to do, it's smart for our economy because these steps will help pay for the investments we need in jobs and education without increasing our national debt. In fact, every
every program I have proposed in this campaign, I tell you how I will pay for it. Now, Donald Trump and I disagree on a lot of things, and one of them is simple math. <laughs> and finally, here's our fifth goal. Let's put families first and make sure our policies match how you actually work and live in the 21st century. Families look a lot different today than they did 30 years ago, and so do our jobs. The movement of women into the workforce has produced enormous economic growth over the past few decades. But with women now the sole or primary breadwinner in a growing number of families, there's more urgency than ever to make it easier for Americans to be good workers, good parents, and good caregivers all at the same time. of work where you could expect to hold a steady job with good benefits for an entire career is long gone. People in their 20s and 30s have come of age in an economy that's totally different. And a lot of young parents are discovering just how tough that is on families. Many people now have wildly unpredictable schedules, or they cobble together part-time work, or they've tried to go independent. Now, flexibility can be good, but you shouldn't have to worry that your family could lose your health care or retirement savings just because you change jobs or start a small business. Why do you think every other... Why do you think every other advanced country has paid family leave? Do you think they're just uh, unrealistic? Or do you think that they have figured out they can have a stabler economy? They can support families. And that's what I want us to do. Working families need predictable scheduling, earned sick days and vacation days, quality affordable child care and health care. These are not luxuries, they're economic necessities. And in today's economy, benefits should be flexible, portable, and comprehensive for everyone. And that means it's time to expand Social Security as well. Especially, especially for older women who are widowed, or have taken time out of the workforce to care for a loved one and who are suffering financially because of that, we need to look to a secure retirement for everyone and to provide families relief from crushing costs in health care, housing, prescription drugs. You know, I looked at the numbers. In some states, two parents earning the minimum wage have to spend up to 35% of their income on child care. For a single parent, it could be 70%. So I have set a goal. Families should not have to pay more than 10% of your income for child care. And I will repeat today what I have said throughout this campaign. I will not raise taxes on the middle class. I will give you tax relief to help ease these burdens. You know, whenever I talk about these family issues, Donald Trump says I'm playing the woman card. <laughs> right? Well, you know what I say, if fighting for child care, paid leave, and equal pay is playing the woman card, then deal me in. <laughs> now look, here's what I want you to understand. It may be difficult to imagine all this getting done when Washington is so broken. I get that. But I really think progress is possible or I would not be standing up here running to be president of the United States. I know Republicans and Democrats can work together because I've done it. As you heard Alicia say, I helped create the Children's Health Insurance Program when I was First Lady. That happened with support from both parties. 
and it now covers 8 million kids. And when you go to get health care for your child, nobody says, are you a Republican or a Democrat? They say, what does your child need? I worked with Republicans many times when I was a senator from New York and as Secretary of State. So I know we can get results that will make real differences in people's lives. I know, however, it's rare. There's no question we need to make Washington work much better than it does today. And that means, in particular, getting unaccountable money out of our politics. One of the reasons this election is so important is because the Supreme Court hangs in the balance. We need to overturn that terrible Supreme Court decision, Citizens United, and then reform our whole campaign finance system. This is about our democracy, but it's also about our economy. Campaign finance reform and reducing the power of special interests is directly related to getting Washington working for people again, making the right investments, putting your jobs and economic security first. That's why I'm passionate about this issue, and I will fight hard to end the stranglehold that the wealthy and special interests have on so much of our government. So let's do this together. A historic investment in jobs, debt-free college, profit sharing, making those at the top pay their fair share, putting families first in our modern economy, and a democracy where working people's voices are actually heard. That is what we are fighting for in this election. As I said, as I said during the primary, I am a progressive who likes to get things done, and we can do this. Now, just for a minute, compare what I am proposing to what we hear from Donald Trump. <laughs> the self-proclaimed king of debt has no real ideas for making college more affordable or addressing the student debt crisis. He has no credible plan for rebuilding our infrastructure apart from his wall. He has no real strategy for creating jobs, just a string of empty promises. And maybe we shouldn't expect better from someone whose most famous words are, you're fired. Well, here's what I want you to know. I do have a jobs program, and as president, I'm going to make sure, sure that you hear you're hired. And here's the bottom line. Economists left, right, and center all agree Donald Trump will drive America back into recession. Just this week, one of Senator John McCain's former economic advisors said Trump's policies would wipe out, wipe out three and a half million jobs. His tax cuts tilted toward the wealthy would add more than $30 trillion to our national debt over the next 20 years. That is just astonishing, and it's no wonder that a group called the Economist Intelligence Unit, one of the leading firms that analyzes the top threats to the global economy, now ranks a Trump presidency number three, right behind problems in China and volatility in the commodities markets. <laughs> now look, I know Donald hates it when anyone points out how hollow his sales pitch really is. And I guess my speech yesterday must have gotten under his skin because right away he lashed out on Twitter with outlandish lies and conspiracy theories and he did the same in his speech today. Now think about it, he's going after me personally because he has no answers on the substance. In fact, 
he doubled down on being the king of death. So all he can do is try to distract us. That's even why he's attacking my faith. Sigh. <laughs> and of course, attacking a philanthropic foundation that saves and improves lives around the world. It's no surprise he doesn't understand these things. The Clinton Foundation helps poor people around the world get access to life-saving AIDS medicine. <laughs> Donald Trump uses poor people around the world to produce his line of suits and ties. Here in North Carolina, you know as well as anyone, our economy is already too unpredictable for working families. We can't let Donald Trump bankrupt America the way he bankrupted his casinos. We need to write a new chapter in the American dream, and it can't be chapter 11. So please join me in this campaign. I'm offering a very different vision about how we're stronger together when we grow together. We're stronger when our economy works for everyone, not just those at the top. I am convinced that if we work hard, if we go into November with the confidence and optimism that should be the American birthright, we will not only win an election, we will chart the course to the future that we want and deserve. Thank you and God bless you. This is my...